Amen. Praise the Lord. That was beautiful. I just want to first start off by praising God. I had a rough night last night because back home, it's getting to be winter. So it's very cold back home. And when I came here, it seemed like it was spring. So I'm allergic to the spring weather. Therefore, I suffered a bout of allergies last night and it was very, very hard for me to sleep. As I thought of you know, what I could do, I told myself I'm gonna get up and I'm gonna take a shower. I'm gonna take a nice hot shower and I'm gonna lay back down. So I tried to get up and take a shower and as soon as I pushed the button to heat the water, the power cut off. So I laid back down and I said, Lord, I'm, I'm just gonna have to trust in you. So this morning I woke up and it was just worse. I, I could barely breathe. My eyes were swollen and itchy. And I said, Lord, what is going on here? So I came this morning and the, the wonderful medical missionaries gave me a treatment this morning and oh, it was wonderful. I, I cleared up immediately. And then I came and I sat down and I said, I'm ready to go. After about 30 minutes, everything just started coming back. And I said, oh no, Lord, oh no. So I said, you know what, I, I need prayer. So I asked my brothers and sisters if they could, they could pray with me, pray for me. And lo and behold, I was completely congested when Sammy stopped his message. But now I can breathe. Amen? Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Our Father and our God in heaven, Lord, I just want to thank you. Thank you that you are such a wonderful God that you see all of our needs. And you are able to meet them, Father. We come to you now humbly bowed, asking for grace and mercy. Please, if there be any sin among us, I pray that you would forgive us. Father, as we have entered this time of fasting, let us remember that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Father, I am but your humble servant, and I pray that you would use me however you see fit. In Jesus' name, amen. So far throughout this camp meeting, we've received a lot of information, haven't we? You know, when I entered into this movement, it was first a shock. I didn't know that there were so many people who were involved in the truth. In fact, I thought I was alone. When I came out of my church, I, I resolved that if I was alone in this truth, I would be fine. But then I came and I found a band of believers who also believed this truth. I was much thrilled to see fellow brothers and sisters who believed and followed the convictions of their heart. But I quickly became disappointed and disheartened because as I traveled from place to place, I found out that there was people with a lot of information. But a lot of people that received the information, the information didn't serve the purpose of transformation. Did you hear what I said? They received the information, but the information didn't serve the purpose of transformation. There's a very, very big problem with us right now. And it's the fact that we believe that since we have the truth, we have everything. Right? 
There's no more reformation that needs to be done. There's no more changing that needs to happen. But that is wrong. That is wrong. We are following Christ through the sanctuary step by step. In Revelation, the 144,000 are made up by those who follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Our journey is not finished until we reach the heavenly Canaan. Amen? In Job chapter 11 and verse 7, this is what it says. Canst thou by searching find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty unto perfection? The one thing that the enemy is aware of is the fact that there is a plan. A plan for you and for me. A plan to transform us, the children of God, into the likeness of his son. Christ is Satan's greatest enemy. And the last thing he wants us to do is to reflect the image of Christ. Therefore, what he does is he comes in, especially amongst us with counterfeits. Right? He tries to supply us with enough information to where we believe that the more information we have, the more saved we are. But we need information that leads to transformation. In Christian Experience and Teaching, page 50 in paragraph 4, this is what it said. Speaking of the 1844, event our hopes now centered on the coming of our of the lord in 1844 this was also the time for the message of the second angel who flying through the midst of heaven cried babylon is fallen is fallen that great city that message was first proclaimed by the servants of god in the summer of 1844 as a result, many left the fallen churches in connection with this message, the midnight cry was given. Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. In every part of the land, light was given concerning this message. And the cry aroused thousands. It went from city to city, from village to village, and into the remote country regions. It reached the learned and talented as well as the obscure and humble. Now, let me ask you a question. In 1844, this message went everywhere. Right? Garnered in so many people of the faith. But what happened? What happened? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 3 and 4, this is what it says. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own what? Lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned onto fables. Brothers and sisters, for 50 years, 50 years, the pioneers and the prophets worked to build a foundation for us to stand upon. What happened? Men came in and tried to shift this foundation, right? 
tried to change the things that were set up as principles of our faith. Claiming to have information. In the Review and Herald, August 12, 1909, paragraph 9. This is what it said. You know, when, before I read that, when I came into this movement, there were a lot of people pointing me in different directions. And the one thing I noticed is that almost the same thing that I came out of was happening in this movement. There were large groups of people following one man or another. Large groups of people following one man or another. And then I began hearing stories. Oh, this person has gone off into apostasy. And what about his followers? Let me ask you a question. Who should we be following? Christ. If we are following anyone, it should be Christ. In the Review and Herald, it says this. It is not learned men. Not eloquent men who are so much needed now. But what type of men? Humble men who in the school of Christ have learned to be meek and lowly, who will go forth into the highways and hedges to give the invitation, come, for all things are now ready. Those who beg at midnight for loaves for hungry souls will be successful. Our salvation is not necessarily based upon the amount of information we obtain, but based upon how tightly we grasp the throne of God. It is based upon our relationship with God. How well we know God. And to know in the Bible is to have an intimate relationship with. It's those who are, who are on their knees day by day. Praying. Fasting. Waiting. Working. Watching. Who are going to be filled with the Spirit of God and be entrusted with the message in these last days, not those who are just seeking information. Philippians chapter three, verse one to eight says this. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing to you. To me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the conscience. For are we, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in what? The flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath, wherefore he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, 
persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law. What? Blameless. What was Paul saying here? When it, when it came to self-confidence, he had it all, right? But how does he finish? But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for who? For Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. Paul could have boasted about anything, but he threw all of that aside and said, I just want Jesus. Right? How much more we? In Prophets and Kings, page 73, paragraph 3. To 74, paragraph 2. This is what it says. Like Christ, the messengers of the Most High today should take their position in these great thoroughfares where they can meet the passing multitudes from all parts of the world, like him hiding self in God. They are to sow the gospel seed, presenting before others the precious truths of the Holy Scriptures that will take deep root in the mind and heart and spring up unto eternal life. Right? The truths of the word should not just have a position in the mind. It's in the mind and the heart. Solemn are the lessons of Israel's fail failure during the, during the years when ruler and people turned from the high purposes they had been called to fulfill, wherein they were weak, even to the point of failure. The Israel of God today, the representatives of heaven that make up the true church of Christ, must be strong. For upon them devolves the task of finishing the work that has been committed to men and of ushering in the day of final awards. Yet the same influences that prevailed against Israel in the time when Solomon reigned, are to be met with still. The forces of the enemy of all righteousness are strongly entrenched. Only by the power of God can the victory be gained. The conflict before us calls for the exercise of a spirit of what? Self-denial. For distrust of self and for dependence on God alone. For the wise use of every opportunity for the saving of souls. How many of you know that there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom? Right? Intelligence is information. Wisdom is the proper application of the information that you have. I can know that a tomato is a fruit, but it'd probably be unwise to put it in my fruit smoothie. The proper application of information is wisdom. The Lord's blessings will attend his church. As they advance, how? Unitedly. Revealing to a world lying in the darkness of error the beauty of holiness as manifested in a Christ-like spirit of 
self-sacrifice. In an exaltation of the divine rather than the human, and in loving and untiring service for those so much in need of the blessings of the gospel. Brothers and sisters, we have so much pure, true information that has been given to us. We need not sit on it. There is a dying world out there that needs what we have. Not just in the mind, but in the heart. We have it to give. God's desire was to make us wellsprings, right? It was the Gospel of Luke as well as Matthew. The Savior is portrayed as a healer, the physician, right? Luke being a physician himself. What good is the doctrine without the doctor? What good is it? It's useless. You can have every bit of truth in the world. But if you don't have the one who is true, it's of no use. In the Review and Herald, April 21st, 1903, paragraph 2 and paragraph 3, this is what it says. In order to labor successfully for God, there must be in the heart an all-absorbing love for him. Heart religion must rule in the life. Until the heart is humble and contrite before God, until the sins which his word denounces are put away, his blessings cannot be given. Those who win sinners to Christ must cherish the principles of Christianity. Why does a tree bear fruit? Why did God ordain that the tree bear fruit? It was to feed us, right? To provide food for us. Why does God desire you to bear fruit? Exactly. Because in bearing fruit, that is the fruit of the Spirit, we can feed others. It will draw others in. Right? Those who do not love God with heart and soul and strength and mind might better go apart and rest a while. They might better take up some other work until they breathe a higher, pure atmosphere. If your heart is not converted, if it is not holy with God, and you are not bearing Christ-like character, it's best that you sit on the sidelines with all the information that you have, because you would be more danger than help. That's what's being said here. For God cannot work with them until their hearts are purified 
through obedience to his word. True workers will put away self-exaltation and self-sufficiency. It is those who have the least evidence of the power of the Spirit of God in their labors who feel the greatest self-exaltation. These will try to repress those to whom God has given the precious truths for which his flock is starving. The bread of life, which will satisfy the hunger of the soul. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom and apply thine, under, thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and lifteth up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth what? Wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the path of judgment and preserveth the ways of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thy mind, where? Into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee, to deliver thee from thy way, from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh forward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness. There's a need for us to take the information instead of putting it in our minds to put it in our hearts. To let it affect a change in us. And that change is going to be evident in the fruit that we bear. We will be loving. We will be patient. We will be kind. There's a Sunday church that I minister to. And I shared the amazing news of what was happening in that church with a few of my brethren. I said, oh man, these people have such a great love. I said, every Sunday I'm at that church and every opportunity that I get, I try to insert a little bit of truth. Every Wednesday, we have prayer meeting. We pray together. I go to the members' houses and I help them with different tasks. And one brother said to me, well, did you teach him about the Sabbath yet? And I said, no. He said, well, what are you waiting for? I said, brother, I'm waiting for God. What do you mean? What I'm waiting for God. And he said, well, 
well, I would have already told them about the Sabbath, the mark of the feet. And so I'm like, well, wow, you know? I said, I'm sorry, I just want to love them first. I just want them to know that I love them. Right before I beat them with truth, can I first gain their heart? I said, that's what Christ did with me. Right? God commended his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He expressed his love before he tried to tell me his truth. Why can't we be the same? It's like, well, we don't have time. Okay. I said, brother, I'm just going to continue and let God lead. I said, because I know if I try to do it, I'm, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. To know God and his son is to have a personal relationship with him. To gain wisdom and understanding concerning the information contained in the word, it must be first settled into the heart. If it's not settled in the heart, there's not going to be a change in the mind. Do you know that it's easier to deceive somebody than to convince somebody that they've been deceived? Once people have information, right, and they take that information and they believe it with all their mind, it is hard to convince somebody. Allow God to change the heart. In John chapter 7 and verse 14 to 17. John chapter 7, verse 14 to 17. Now about the midst of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and taught. And the Jews marveled, saying, how knoweth this man letters, having never learned? Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. What was Jesus saying? He was telling them, look, the relationship that I have is more important than the information. Because the relationship will do what? Provide all the information that I need. The relationship that he sustained with his father and the relationship we sustain with Christ will allow us to see truth from error. There's a terrible, terrible doctrine going around that God is so loving, he will not punish. Right? He's so loving that what he said he will do, he won't. I mean, he won't really do it. The only way something like that settles in a mind is a lack of a true relationship. Lack of the understanding of what love is. Is love all permissive? No. No. The Bible tells us that God is what? Love. You know, I, I thought about that for such a long time. 
And I asked myself, why doesn't the word of God say God has love? Right? Or God gives love. God himself is love. Why couldn't the Pharisees discern the doctrines of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 14. It says this. Now we have received... Not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. That we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak. Not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with Spiritual things. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are what? Spiritually discerned. You see, when it comes to an intimate knowledge of God, there's a process outlined. Right? Information must come into the mind, but it cannot stay there. It cannot stay there. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, 11, and verse 16. This is what it says. Speaking of the new covenant, it says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. Does it stop there? No. And write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest. When truth, when knowledge of God has entered into the mind, it must settle in the heart. And once it settles in the heart, guess what? We can pick up the word of God and discern the character of God through his word. From the least to the greatest. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. When the law of God is written, in the heart, it will be exhibited in a pure, holy life. Can we achieve holiness? Absolutely. They are spirit and life, bringing the imaginations and even the thoughts into subjection to the will of Christ. The heart in which they are written will be kept with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. All who love Jesus and keep the commandments will seek to avoid the very appearance of evil, not because they are constrained thus to do, but because they are copying a pure model and feel averse 
to everything contrary to the law written where? In their hearts. They will not feel self-sufficient, but their trust will be in God, who alone is able to keep them from sin and impurity. The atmosphere surrounding them is pure. They will not corrupt their own souls or the souls of others. It is their pleasure to deal justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly before God. That was taken from the Review and Herald, May 17th, 1887. Paragraph two. Now this is paragraph three. The danger that lies before those living in these last days is the absence of pure religion, the absence of heart holiness. The converting power of God has not wrought in the transformation of their characters. They profess to believe the sacred truths as the Jewish nation did. But in their failing to practice the truth, they are ignorant both of the scriptures and of the power of God. Did you hear that? In failing to practice the truth, they're ignorant of the scriptures. The power and influence of God's laws, of God's law, are around about, but not within the soul, renewing it in true holiness. Therefore, the Lord sends his appeal to them to urge upon them the practice of what is right. The appeals of his spirit are neglected and rejected. The barriers are broken down. And the soul is weak. And for want of moral force to overcome is polluted and debased. They are binding themselves in bundles as faggots, ready to be consumed at the last day. And somebody who has all truth be lost. Absolutely. Truth must enter in to the heart. It was the people of God in Christ's day that had the most knowledge of the word of God. And so it is today that the chosen church of God has the most knowledge. And some are seeking greater knowledge in vain. In fact, the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the Jews with a pretense of great wisdom for the word of God added over 600 laws of their own. In Matthew chapter 23, verse 13 and verse 15, this is what it says. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. For ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Is it possible for someone coming into the truth to see someone in the truth who's not living out the truth and forsake the truth? Absolutely. We are the representatives of God. And if we misrepresent God and a soul is lost because of it, who's to blame? It's on us. Verse 15. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye compass sea 
and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. Now listen to this. The Jews with their errors and presumed wisdoms went making proselytes, didn't they? Think about this. Where did the doctrine of the Nicolaitans come from? You know where it came from? It came from Nicholas, who was one of the chosen of God. Nicholas was one of the elders chosen. Didn't Jesus say, hey, look, wolves will come in, right? Men will come in desiring to seek followers after themselves. Is it possible that that could happen in a body of believers today? Absolutely. Do I dare say it is happening? The Review and Herald, August 29th, 1899. The fearful denunciations were made upon the Jews because while teaching the law of God to the people, they were not doers of the word. Had they kept the law of God, they would have discerned Christ and his mission. So it is in our day. There are those who walk in darkness when light shines from every page written in the word the study the they study the scriptures that they may interpret them to suit themselves they sink the scriptures to their own perverted ideas they are not honest they doubt that which that which they have every reason to believe they become reasoners in doubt experts in finding fault God's word is misrepresented, misstated, misapplied, and has no power upon the life and the character. The Bible tells us how to receive true information that leads to transformation and how to know what is true doctrine. In James chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 6, it says this, if any of you lack wisdom, what? Ask of who? God, that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be what? Given him. But let him ask how? In faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with wind and tossed. When under the temptations of Satan, sorry, Review and Herald, December, December 16, 1890, this is paragraph 14. When under the temptations of Satan, men fall into error and their words and deportment are not Christ-like, they may not realize their condition because sin is deceptive and tends to deaden the moral perceptions but through self-examination, searching of the scriptures, and humble prayer, they will, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, be enabled to see their mistake. If they then confess their sins and turn from them, the tempter will not appear to them as an angel of light, but as a deceiver. An accuser of those whom God desires to use for his glory. Those who acknowledge reproof and correction as from God and are thus enabled to see and correct their errors are learning precious lessons, even from their mistakes. You know, the greatest sin of man is pride. 
It's hard for us to admit that we were wrong. God says there's a blessing in there. And when we can't admit that we're wrong, we're just robbing ourselves of a blessing. She continues to say their apparent defeat is turned into victory. They stand trusting not in their own strength, but to the strength of God. They have earnestness, zeal, and affection united with humility and regulated by the precepts of God's word. Thus, they bring forth the peaceable fruits of righteousness. Listen. The Lord can teach them his will, and they shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God. They walk not stumblingly, but safely in a path where the light of heaven shines. All we have to do is allow God to lead us. Give him our heart, the whole of our heart. And he can, he will. Listen to how Paul was led. Galatians chapter one and verse one says, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by who? Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Next to the Apostles 127, paragraph 1, says this. As Paul searched the scriptures, he learned that throughout the ages, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And abase the things of the world. And things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are. That no flesh should glory in his presence. And so viewing the wisdom of the world in the light of the cross, Paul determined not to know anything save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Throughout his later ministry, Paul never lost sight of the source of his wisdom and strength. Hear him years afterwards still declaring, for to me to live is Christ. And again, I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Brothers and sisters, please, please, we need to sincerely pray for each other. We really do. We are in the tiptoes of the statue in Daniel. And we need the grace and mercy of God to be upon us. We need it. If we are not hid in Christ, we're liable to go astray. Sin is deceptive. And believe me, sin is not just bearing false witness. It is not just committing adultery. Right? As etched out by the pen. But Jesus said, if you have hate in your heart towards your brother, that is a sin. 
If you looketh on a woman with lust in your heart, that is a sin. The sin need not be just in the action, but the contemplation itself. And believe me, sin is deceptive. So let us not have all of this truth, right? Let us not have all of this doctrine and forsake the doctor. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, it is our desire that your will be performed on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we are asking for that daily bread as we continue in this fast. Lord, continue to feed us spiritually. Father, because the body may die, but we need to fear them, not who can destroy the body, but fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. We need you more than ever, O oh God. And I pray that above all things, we would seek wisdom. Wisdom in how to go out and how to come in. Wisdom in every area of our life. Father, it's our desire to be ambassadors for you in this world. And we can't do that without our heart being changed. We know that there is an enemy who desires for the natural man to arise. But Father, remember, we have an advocate before you. Jesus Christ, the righteous. And it is in him that we put all of our trust. It is in him that we desire to follow to the ends of this world. Father, thank you for the precious promises that are found in your word. We know that you are here and that you hear our prayer and that you will answer the prayers which come up to you in sincerity. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.